First of all, I would just like to say following Dimitri on the stage is, I feel a bit like a child who just learned how to play chopsticks on the piano following Beethoven on the stage. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and I'd like to thank all of you joining this Congress in person as well as online. This Congress that's on a critical um, subject at the moment. I'll see if I can get this to work. As the UN Secretary General pointed out just a few weeks ago, it really feels like at the moment we are trying to re-establish world peace rather than just preserve it. Um, we've entered into a new age. I'm going to throw also a bit of mud at digital platforms uh, throughout this brief talk, so I'd just like to share a brief story to show I do acknowledge the other side. Uh, when once in Mosul, just outside, we got a flat tire in an area controlled by the Islamic State in the nighttime and the army in the daytime. And of course, it, dusk was just falling. And there we were on the road with a flat tire in a road that was about to fall back into Islamic State hands. And we looked for the tire and we looked for the levers and we looked for the jack. The car belonged to the driver's uncle, so he didn't know and it got dark and that look of fear came on us and it was like, this is not funny anymore. And suddenly the cameraman threw out the sat dish, opened his phone, put up YouTube and said, Toyota Land Cruiser, how do you fix the tire? 20 minutes later, we were on the road to an army base again and YouTube probably saved our lives. So yeah, look, there's a lot of positive uses for digital platforms. I used it to navigate here, to coordinate getting to this room. We use it all the time. And on a more serious note, you know, beginning with the Haiti earthquake in 2010, we saw crowdfunding over the internet uh, to assist people there. And we're seeing that again in Ukraine with the refugees. And even down to things like citizens pouring over satellite photos in the public domain to search out human rights abuses. There are many positive uses for digital platforms. Uh, on the uh, flat tire story still, I actually met this man, uh, Mahmoud Mohammed, just a small digression. This guy had lived in Syria. He had an orchard passed down for families. That had been seized by the Islamic State. He fled to Mosul. That was seized by the Islamic State. I met him on the side of a road living in a tin shack this big with his family, uh, huddled in there. But he was just one of those incredible human beings that inspires. And instead of going to the camp, he was working so that he could try and make the money to send the two children to school, not so they could have a comfortable life, he said, so that they could improve the world. And he held up the pen. First of all, actually, he said, Akbar. And then he said, if people could just understand the riches of the world beneath their feet, there would be no more war. And it was one of those moments where I was sitting there looking at a deadline, taking some comments, filing for the evening, and it wakes you up and you think, I've got to do my job better if I'm to make an impact. Uh, it's like seeing Dimitri talk. It's like attending the con Congress. It's like a wake-up call. Um, and these things, I think these moments are really important. So let's talk about the communications era that we live in. There has been an upsurge in the amount of fake news and misinformation as a result of the digital revolution, which marks the start of what is now known as the communications era that we live in. Much of this distorted information comes from individuals, but a very large portion of it, as we just heard from Dimitri, comes from state actors. The upsurge is happening at exactly the same time that we journalists find ourselves doing more work that requires juggling, print, with video, with camera, with online, everybody doing the same job, for less money and bigger time pressures. Because as traditional outlets are downsizing and prioritizing online, con online content as more people seek their content from the digital arena, though most of the outlets in that arena are still struggling to make funds, which means they're still struggling to function at a high level. So in short, the pressure on journalists is ironically a direct result of the communications era. An era that the American thinker and author John Nesbitt defined as leaving us drowning in information, but starved of knowledge. I will talk 
about the specific challenges of covering conflict in the digital age, but I would also like to first address just some of the common uh, challenges. It's not just for conflict, it's for all aspects of media. One of the reasons we're being starved of knowledge, I believe, is because information is being stripped down to the basics in order to better fit the short attention span items promoted by online platforms to encourage us to scroll through as much content as possible, which generates more revenue through advertising, or just to keep us level, uh, to keep us loyal, sorry, so that they can sell our details, our contacts, all of our information to whoever is willing to pay for it. That is unfortunately the shape of the digital world we increasingly live in. Another key reason it, um, is that our digital information is now herded towards us by artificial intelligence for the same reasons. So our phones, our laptops, our computers now know more about us than our partners, our children, our friends far more about us. Having been in Ukraine throughout the Maidan revolution, throughout the seizure of Crimea, throughout the start of the war in the Donbass, I'm without any doubt a little bit personally invested. I can't say I'm completely neutral on the subject um, and all of my devices know it. If I want to look at something, perhaps a nice tune on the engine in a search engine, I might go to YouTube, look for a song I like, there's no doubt the top suggestion will usually be a, something like a drone dropping a bomb on a Russian tank or soldier. Now, I never search for that kind of content. Far from it. The exact opposite. But AI knows where my sympathies lie, and so it keeps sending me the most extreme manifestations of my ideas, or the way I might think, or the way any of us thinks, in order to get us to click. Because it knows the moderate view won't get a click, or the less moderate, it has to be the extreme view. Of course, there's always been bias in the media, whether it's radio, print, whatever it is, there's always been bias. But in the general dealings, it was never quite as biased, and also, you could tune into other opinions. You know, when you looked around, there were other opinions. Um, you know, they presented themselves, and I think there was still room to intellectually evolve. The digital age hasn't put an end to that, but it is throwing up serious challenges. Of course, I never see anything showing Russia being victorious over Ukrainian forces. I know that's happening. There's plenty of it out there being watched by people like one of my family members, who's a fierce Putin supporter. He thinks migrants should all be tossed out. Gay bashers are just fine. And <laughs> there's a lot of other opinions that are, uh, you know, like the, the war is all NATO's fault. Um, all of his news feeds, without exceptions, reinforce his viewpoint. 100%. Whereas I'm fed a constant stream of videos and news updates that would indicate that Vladimir Putin actually has a serious illness. He's probably going to die any day. And if he doesn't, there'll be a coup to overthrow him, that all Russians hate him, and that Ukrainian forces are doing so well that if we looked at a map, they'd probably be in Moscow on Monday. That's the way the internet now works. That's the way information now largely works. Even a decade ago, I could turn off my computer, pick up a newspaper, turn on the television, still get a slightly biased view, but a much better idea of what is actually going on. And why? Unfortunately now, polarized partisanship is the norm, with old school, conventional networks mimicking digital platforms in a desperate bid that's not working to retain viewers, listeners, readers. For instance, if you think COVID and climate change are hoaxes and that vaccines are being designed by a one world government to track us, tune into that famous US network on the right. If you believe vaccines never hurt a single person, stop people without fail from being infected, that herd immunity to COVID is a real thing, try that other network that openly promotes the opposing political party. Our mainstream networks, even off the digital platforms, are so polarized now because of the digital world and their need to compete. 
For the real story, we have to wait another 10 years for the documentary, but we won't get to see it because AI algorithms will be so busy pushing sensational nonsense in our direction and misinformation. These are the problems that afflict news coverage, at least the consumption of it, of all events. But conflict does have some unique attributes. One of them is the ability of social media, the digital platforms, mes messaging apps, to actually fuel them. I'm pretty sure that without them, we would never have had a group like the so-called Islamic State, or at least it would have never grown as big and deadly as it became. IS used social media and messaging apps aggressively to pursue recruitment and organize its campaigns. It also used social media to promote its activities with a degree of sophistication that even few states have matched. Al-Qaeda, which remains very old school in comparison, just couldn't and still can't compete with those internet savvy upstarts. And somewhat perversely, this is also the lesson mainstream media is learning. And our challenge is to adapt to the technology without succumbing to using emotive content, stories that last just a few seconds, facts with a heavy slant, and graphic content to attract and maintain an audience. The BBC is in the process of a big shift right now, really leading the way in this area I've just described. It's merging its world news and domestic news content into one channel and it's sending BBC4, Radio4 Extra and CBBC purely online. The BBC calls it a digital first priority. The focus, according to the Beeb, will be streamlining live updates of events as they happen, which has proved to be very popular for everyone. That, of course, means the focus will now shift away from a long history of in-depth reporting that requires extensive research, investigation, and preparation, which probably would have happened anyway given the scope of the job cuts that are going to accompany all this and the extra work burdens that the remaining reporters will have to face, including being anchors, being presenters. But what else can the BBC, or in fact any other big linear network do, really, in this age? The modern consumer demands, and I'm a modern consumer as well, so all of we, we demand what we want, when we want it, and that is always now. Perhaps, though, it's not all so grim. In my eyes, the BBC has come alive during the war in Ukraine and has been doing a lot of things we need to talk about when it comes to ways we really can promote peace in the digital age. The BBC has been working tirelessly to debunk fake news and misinformation, and here's the important bit, on both sides. Not just the side it opposes, and let's not pretend we're so at pure and neutral in journalism that we don't take sides, though even as we do, we must still allow the other side to have its voice. That's critical. So why is debunking false information important? and not just a distraction from traditional news content. Because it has such a powerful effect when it comes to opinion forming. It's like an endless game of whack-a-mole. But if journalists aren't going to do it, who is? How can we promote peace if we are not tirelessly attacking hate whipped up by lies? It's like the BBC awoke from the zombie stupor that it and every other mainstream media outlet, I have to say, experienced from the lead up to the second Gulf War until the collapse of the, uh, of the Kabul government one year and one day ago today when the Taliban took power again in Afghanistan. This fake news busting trend picked up steam during the pandemic. But in the mainstream press, at least away from Fox, tended to target information coming from the anti-vax side. There was also information from the other camp, well-meaning information, but nonetheless, blind-eyeing it in the press led to a massive amount of mistrust and a faster stampede towards eccentric podcasters who pass themselves off as sort of journalists. 
So I am happy to see this trend happening. And I can see this is already gaining momentum elsewhere across other media outlets. A drive back towards transparency and facts that are genuinely factual. And calling out lies, no matter who tells them. Let this continue, please, on a massive scale. I have reason to see this move as a pivotal moment for us journalists regaining a lot, or at least some of the trust, um, that is really essential to get people to turn back into mainstream media content. It was a few days, well, more than two decades ago, my unease with the media began around about the same time as the public's unease when I was working at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in the lead up to the second Gulf War. And it was a time when journalists were running around with giddy excitement, trying on their chemical suits and body armor and helmets, so excited that a war was coming, getting their box full of jingoism to pour into their stories that would begin with the drums of war. And, and this is one of the sad truths. Most journalists like war. And as Dimitri said, you know, we've got to be trying to stop wars and oppose them. But the truth is, we journalists like going to war. I, I was very cynical about it at the time, but I've covered a lot of war since. And yes, I have enjoyed a lot of it, the camaraderie, the intensity. That, you know, it's, it's, it's like a poison in the profession, and that has to be recognized. The first Gulf War was driven largely by the testimony of a traumatized 15-year-old girl before the US Congress, relieving the horrors she'd witnessed, except, of course, she hadn't. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. And it had all been set up by Hill and Knowlton, the PR company, who'd been hired by a Kuwaiti lobby group to start the war. The lies were so thin that even a brief examination would have laid them bare, but they were not laid bare by the mainstream Western media because we were all too excited about the war. No one even thought to question it. The second Gulf War was based on yet another great falsehood, Saddam Hussein's possession of weapons of mass destruction. We never even asked what that meant. Atomic bombs, ballistic missiles with conventional warheads? We don't know, because we never asked. War fever was in the air, and at the very moment, fact-checking and some fake news departments were needed, and a thorough investigation should have been happening, there was instead the frenzied excitement among reporters keen to go to war, to some dusty desert adventure where the bad guys get killed and we get to watch it and write about it. The jingoism literally at the time was like the 1800s, what you would see in the old broadsheets. And the result, of course, was a travesty in terms of lives lost or ruined, but also in terms of Western governments and the media losing trust among the public. It was a trust built through blood, sweat and tears, mostly after the social unrest that swept the world in 1968, where a generation took to the streets from Mexico City to Paris to demand accountability, transparency and basic common decency. The press did their bit. In the United States, they managed to help end an unjust war in Vietnam and bring down a president. Not bad. Journalists built up a lot of capital with the public during those heady days, and we've been spending the last few decades squandering it. However, now teams of researchers are, even as we talk, working in news departments tasked with the sole aim of fact-checking and shooting down misinformation and outright fake news. And while it is the digital world making disinformation easier to make and spread, it is the same digital world that now helps us to debunk lies, whether it be in traditional information research, poring over online documents, or scanning satellite images, or just Google Maps to see if such and such really happened in that village at that time, or even if that village is where it is, or even if the village actually exists. Of course, that can't be our only job. We still have to, and I shall read from the Australia's Code of Media Ethics, to report and interpret honestly, striving for accuracy, fairness, and disclosure of all essential facts, to not suppress relevant available facts or give distorting emphasis, to do our utmost to give a fair opportunity for apply. 
It sounds almost quaint these days, but it's important to remember that these lines cannot be crossed. And there is a place in the digital domain for real reporting. Of course, one of the big challenges is digital newsrooms now. The last one I went into, um, you know, 100, I asked anybody here with a reporting back room, background, not one in 100 could put up their hands and say yes. I do see that changing as more conventional journalists move into the digital arena because they're losing their jobs in the mainstream arena. But look, these pressures are just huge at the moment. But I would say, let's not despair. I'm not sure if we can manage the digital first as well as we should, but I know that we have to because time is not on our side. We have to give up some of our cherished traditions and accept the digital world in the same way writers had to accept radio, radio had to accept television, and television has to accept the internet. Will digital platforms continue that trend we're seeing? That those platforms turned people, uh, gave people a revulsion of war, each new step. So will digital platforms do that? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because we've got so many it's, uh, of the keyboard warriors now. It's feeding into the nationalists. We have so many people looking at the content and thinking, well, that's not happening to me. My world's fine. In a way, it reinforces a bigoted world view. But we have to step up to these challenges. And the very fact that we're having this conversation here today, talking face to face at this critical juncture, means we do care as people, as a profession, we are taking these issues seriously. And we must, because how else can we act as a beacon of clarifying light in what used to simply be called the fog of war, and it now feels like the fog of the digital age? Thank you.